I will tell of your faithfulness. I'll declare, Lord, your covenant with my life. With my mouth, I will tell of Welcome to New Life. Very good to be together today. For those of you who are joining us virtually, welcome as well. Uh, yeah, I just feel like it just feels good to be worshiping together this morning. Thank you for those of you that are here for the endurance of doing church in a pandemic. I start worship today with just kind of this reminder, keep your masks on, covering your mouth and your nose. We're going to love each other that way as we continue to navigate and do have endurance uh, of doing church in a pandemic. We're really grateful for that. You know, as I approach worship this week in a really volatile political week, I actually thought of the story of Mephibosheth in the Bible. If you don't know Mephibosheth, he was the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan. And if you remember uh, about uh, Saul and David's relationship, they had some political conflict, so much so that in moments of jealousy, Saul multiple times threw spears at David, wanting to pin him to the wall. Wow. And as I considered the story as it unfolds, the story goes on that David, though the rightful thing for him to do in that day or what would have been acceptable is for David to actually kill all of the people in Saul's family 
as David became the king so that he could not be contested as the new king of Israel. But the story unfolds that David actually invites Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, to come and live with him in his palace. It's this really tender story. It's not what you would expect in such a politically volatile uh, relationship. Folks, this week, there's been some spears thrown. Maybe you've had some spears thrown at you. Maybe you've actually thrown some spears yourself. And we feel this tension of division. And yet, as we continue to unpack and unfold the story of Scripture, we see that God invites people who have lots of natural differences, lots of reasons to be enemies, to come together because of Jesus and by the work of the Holy Spirit to be one, to be united. So actually, I invite you to stand today for the call of worship. And as you stand to declare the call to worship today, we're standing side by side with people who voted differently than us this week. And yet, because of Jesus, because of the story of Scripture, because of the story of the gospel, we can come together as one and declare that God alone deserves worship. So I invite you to do this as an act of faith together as we begin worship to, uh, today. Our, our call to worship is from Psalm 95. Let's read this together. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Amen.
seated. So maybe if you're like me, that story of Mephibosheth kind of resonates in your heart and you kind of walk away saying, yes, I want to be like David. I want to move towards those who are my enemies. And I think that's a good and right response to that story. But we, we miss the, the gospel in this story when we start to compare ourselves to David because in this story, we're Mephibosheth. We are the one who is actually, Mephibosheth was crippled. He was broken. He couldn't even come into David's house and help himself. He completely was dependent on this good King David. He he was an enemy. His name actually is wrapped up in, in the Hebrew word of shame. Mephibosheth came and had nothing but brokenness to offer And brothers and sisters, until we understand that the gospel story is that that's who we are, we can never love our brothers and sisters, let alone our enemies. So I invite you this morning to pray pray a prayer of confession with me. And in this moment, we're coming to God and saying, we are enemies. Apart from Jesus, we're enemies. We're needy, we're broken. We require you to bring anything of value to us. So I I invite you to read this prayer of confession from 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, After we read it, we'll just spend a a minute of quiet silence for you just to reflect on what we have just read. So read this together with me. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Just spend a moment reflecting on what we just read. No more, my God, I boast no more of all the duties I have done. I quit the hopes I held before to trust the merit of thy son. No more, my God. No more, my God. No more, my. 
Stand. Now for the loss, I bear his name. What was my gain? I count my loss. My former pride, I call my shame. Name my glory to his cross. No more, my God. No more, my God. No more, my God. I boast no more. Yes, said I must, will esteem all things but a loss. No more, my God. No more, my God. No more, my God. No more, my God. I boast no Our story is Mephibosheth's story, where we are brought together to somebody, towards somebody who should be our enemy. We are brought out of shame into confidence and hope, not because of what we bring, but because the king invites us to his table and treats us like his sons and daughters. That is the hope and the confidence that we have today. So read together with me this assurance of pardon from 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31. And let's read as forgiven sons and daughters together, receiving God's pardon. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts Boast in the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And as we get ready for our congregational prayer, this is the time where we would uh, give our general offering. And actually, at the end, we would normally do a, a deacon's offering because today is communion. So there's boxes that are by the door. Feel free to uh, contribute as you leave. Those of you that are online, you can go to the church's websites or the app uh, to give your tithes and offering. Thank you. Let's pray together. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Jesus, we come together today from so many different places, Lord. Um, this week has taken us all on a ride in so many ways, Lord. We're tired and weary. 
some of us relieved, some of us burdened, some of us feeling hopeful, some so anxious, Lord. And God, we ask that we would remember um, you are the answer to everything, Jesus. We come humbly, and may we come so aware of your love for us and your desire to meet us where we're at, Jesus. Lord, we bring you um, Laurel Keel before you today, God, and we're so thankful for her servant's heart. Lord, we ask that as she mentors others, that they would see the truth um, that she is bringing from you. Lord, we especially lift up the group that she's working with as she walks with them through sorting out um, their trauma with you, Lord. God, we pray for our staff as they continue to navigate ministering um, in a pandemic, Lord, that you would give them great wisdom and discernment to continue to find ways to reach this congregation, Jesus, and this community with the love of Christ, even in such a very tricky time. And God, we pray for um, Sue and Ron Lutz, Lord, and this um, fight against cancer that's so painful and long and hard, Lord, and Jesus, please help them to feel how near you are. And we pray for Monica Angstadt, Lord, and for Dale Leonard, um, and for all that are close to them as they're on hard journeys, um, that you would be their comforter and they would feel your provision and guidance and peace. Lord, we, we pray especially today for John Standen, who suffered a stroke, God, and um, continues to be in the hospital, Lord. And God, we ask for healing and for comfort and rest, especially for Cheryl and his family, Lord. And God, I pray um, for the Lord's Supper today, um, this sacred meal that is a family meal, God, and um, for brothers and sisters. And what a time, Lord, um, when as Americans, even the brothers and sisters of Christ um, were so divided. And um, God, I pray that even though some of us are at peace and some of us are living in fear, Lord, that you would heal your family, Lord. You would unite us through your son. God, I, I pray for um, this transition of power, Lord. I pray for um, our president-elect, Joe Biden, and Kamala Harris, Lord. God, we ask that you would bring unity and peace in this country, Lord, and especially in this family of God. Help us to celebrate this meal together today and take big steps towards um, laying down our judgments towards each other, towards other political parties and standpoints, and remember um, where we all met Jesus at the foot of your cross, because we needed a loving Savior so desperately, God. We thank you for today and for the opportunity to gather. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you today. My name is Anthony Gamage, lead pastor here at New Life, where we exist to know Jesus and to make him known. Uh, if you are new, we would love to know that you are joining us either in person or uh, online. You can do so by texting CONNECT to the number on your screen there. And I just want to look at all of you this morning and say congratulations. Um, you've made it through the week. Uh, well done. Uh, it, was, it was quite a week, and I know uh, these journeys in the political world are far from over, uh, but you know the good news is today, uh, just like will be true in four more years when we walk through this again, is that uh, Jesus is our King, He is still on the throne, and our hearts, if we claim to be followers of Him, are to continue to do so, and my prayer is as we look at uh, the songs and wisdom that we find in Scripture, that, that we would tune our hearts to ask Him, okay, Lord, what does it look like to follow You uh, in these ways? And so, uh, know that I'm praying for you uh, as we walk through this season together. Well, we continue to walk through the story of redemption, the Christian story. We've been uh, walking through this picture, really, this painting by uh, David Arms entitled God's Story, and we've looked at creation, fall, and we are in that third panel of redemption, God's work of redemption, and this is uh, the lion's share, the bulk of of the Bible as we read through it. And today is going to be a little bit different because uh, this is actually a section that doesn't drive the story forward, uh, but actually is filled with different forms of literature, songs and wisdom that God's people roll around in their minds as they move through 
this story of redemption. So it's going to feel a little different today, uh, but, but just encouraging you to maybe tune your ears for something a little bit different. And, and as we walk through this, I want you to just have an image in your mind this morning uh, of AirPods, all right? AirPods, here's the little case. If you don't know what they are, uh, they're little earbuds without wires that you put in your ear. And I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of people walk around with these in their ears almost 20 seven, and essentially they're listening to things as they go throughout their day. And so as we walk through our story of redemption, I want you to think about what's playing on your AirPods, all right? Even if you don't wear them, use them, think about that picture as we walk through this time. And, and for me, when I wear my AirPods, I'm, I'm usually listening to one of two things, either Spotify uh, or audiobooks or podcasts, all right? That's what I'm listening to as I walk through it. And, and with regards to Spotify, there's been something that the Lord just kind of put in my life that's been fascinating over the course of the last month. Uh, and it's music and its impact that it has and has had on me, because that's what I listen to primarily on Spotify. And this has come to my attention through some of our staff meetings. Uh, so uh, Tommy Leahy, who's our director of worship, uh, and Carrie Silver, who's our coordinator of mission, we will have our planning meeting for Sunday mornings on Tuesday, and something hilarious has emerged at the beginning of all of those meetings where uh, I think Tommy uh, just thinks it's hilarious that Carrie and I uh, have a vast array of music, at least from the 90s and early 2000s, stuck in our head. And so he'll just open Spotify before our meeting, then he'll just start playing songs. You know, just go through it. And sometimes it's 90s country, sometimes it's hip hop, sometimes, you know, who knows. But we know all the words, they all just come spilling out of us. As it plays, the other night, uh, me and two other brothers were sitting around a, a, a bonfire, and, and we were just talking about all the concerts we went to uh, when we were younger, and we found out that two of us were in the same, at the same concert in Roanoke, Virginia. And I left, and I said, give me your top two songs, and we'll listen to them on the way home. And as I listened to them, my heart just returned to all of those emotions that I had processed back in those years. Podcasts and audiobooks, uh, you'll catch me listening to things like Michael Hyatt, which is like a productivity guru, and when I'm done listening to that, you know what I'm doing? I'm really organized. I'll have goals that I'm setting for the year. Like, that's how I come out of that. Or Guy Raz is how I built this, which is these stories of entrepreneurship. And I have a little notebook. I'm just writing down ideas of creativity every time I listen to that. But, but what has struck me is, is via Spotify or podcast, they impact me at a deep level as I walk through the narrative of my own story. You get this, right? Maybe it's Bob Dylan. Maybe it's Bruce Springsteen who had another album drop. Maybe for those of you who loved him growing up, it took you back to being 16 down the shore, right? Or Third Eye Blind or Boys to Men. I listen to Boys to Men a lot. Uh, <laughs> Biggie and Tupac. Uh, parents, if you want to understand what's going on with the younger generation, by the way, I'm not endorsing, I'm not telling you to go home and listen to them, but, but turn on Juice World. Listen to that. I, I've, I saw sixth grade boys weep at his death a little over a year ago. And he really tapped into some of the narratives that are going around in Gen Z. Dear Evan Hansen, the musical, that is something that has tapped into uh, some of the formation that is happening at a deep heart level of those generations. And, and here's what I would just say, is that the most fundamental things that will shape our minds is what we're listening to in our AirPods. The songs we're listening to, the wisdom that we're listening to in our podcasts, whatever that may be. Why? Because the nature of songs and wisdom type things like podcasts are things that we turn over and over again in our minds and in our hearts. And we're foolish to think these things aren't constantly shaping us. And so this morning we're going to be talking about songs and wisdom. And God's wisdom, he gave us not just law, not just stories, not just letters from Paul, but he gives us poetry in the Psalms, he gives us wisdom in books like Proverbs so that we may, as followers of Christ, roll ideas of him over and over again in our minds to shape us to look more like Jesus. So here's the question. What are you turning over and over and in your mind and in your hearts? Your music, your wisdom literature, and your podcasts. And so again, as I said, um, what we're talking about today doesn't necessarily move the narrative forward, but it reflects, as we read these in God's Word, the insight and the revelation that God has His people turning over in their minds over the course of the story of redemption that, that shaped them into this story. 
That's what these songs and wisdom pieces have. And so today's going to feel a little different. We're going to do a high-level survey of the Psalms, uh, or at least just touching on some themes there, and a quick high-level survey of the book of Proverbs. And so the first point today is we're going to look at Spotify. We're going to look at the Psalms, and we're going to look at this God who makes his people sing, because that's what the Psalms are. It's poetry, right? It's very different than other forms of literature. And it's God meeting his people in various forms of emotional positions, right, which we may be in today, a a, a wide range of emotions, and causes them to sing. And these songs sound very different. This was their hymnal. So I want you to also keep in mind that, that these are songs that God's people would sing together if they landed there that day or they didn't. And if their neighbor landed there that day, they're basically empathizing with where their, co, uh, <laughs> their friends are, are, are laboring emotionally. So let me walk you through. Here's Psalm 40. Ready? Here's one song. The psalmist says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Good news, right? This is a, this is a happy, positive song. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me, and your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. But then there's a shift. For evil has encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O God. What's happening here? Friends, this is a really honest psalm that's talking about the fact that deliverance one time doesn't mean that bad things won't happen again. He's saying, you've delivered me from something, right? We're not quite sure exactly what it is, and and he's celebrating God's goodness and deliverance, but then he turns around and says, "Uh uh-oh, my enemies are around me again. I'm suffering at the hand of my own sin. And so it's the psalmist being really honest with the broken nature of the world around us. Just because we survive sickness doesn't mean we won't get sick again. Just because we survive sickness doesn't mean we're not ever going to run out of money. Or our kids won't walk away from the faith. What happens as we sing this song, it's it's an intense song, where the Christian knows that we will need God's help time and time again. And as this song plays in our AirPods, you know what happens? It continually reminds us, even in the depths of woe, that God is faithful, and he will continue to show up, regardless of what we face. Here's some other songs that are rolling around in the heads of God's people. Psalm 100, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. God's people sang this together when they felt it and when they didn't, and it shaped them. Here's a category that I continue to to kind of hit on because I think it's one of the most underdeveloped categories, especially for Christians in America, and it's that of lament. It's that of lament, the language of sacred sorrow. Here's an example, one of my favorites that I write prayers around for many of you, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? God's not afraid of these questions. He wants us to ask those questions, but of the right person, him. He doesn't balk at them. And it also shapes us in our lament and sorrow uh, to, in a Godward direction, where by the end of these psalms, all but one, It lands in categories like this, where I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Friends, the language of lament is important because it it helps us know how to grieve the things we can't change. It helps us to take courage that others have wrestled with God and have come out on the other side full of faith. How about repentance? It's a form 
of lament. And, and I've shared with you before that uh, there has been certain besetting sins in my life that uh, when, when I, I, I fall to those, right, when I rebel against God, I will shut my Bible and I've literally hid my Bible under a pillow and given distance to it because I was sitting in shame. And God gives us language in that moment to not wither in shame, but to move towards him. When you have David, who had, who had committed adultery and murder, and he had lied, and he probably felt a hundred times more shame than I felt in that moment, where he says this, God's saying, this is how you sing to me, this is how you come to me in that moment. Have mercy to me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, restore to me the joy of my salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. It, it helps us not remain in that place of shame and navel-gazing and self-loathing and moves us towards a God who forgives and cares and continues to move towards us joyfully, despite our rebellion. And friends, when we think of things like thanksgiving and lament, I recognize it today, looking at many of you, some of you are full of thanksgiving this week because of the results of the election, and some of us are coming in lamenting. And the Psalms give us words to sing together so that we can say wherever we are, we are coming together to give thanks to God and to bring our cares to Him. Why is this important? Why is it important to roll these songs around in our hearts to shape our emotions? Well, yesterday, I had an opportunity to go to an art show. Uh, it was an art show um, for uh, the work of a man named Roger Anliker. Uh, Dale Roberts, who is an artist in our midst, he uh, basically oversees his estate and put this uh, show together. And this one painting struck me in particular. So uh, Dale works uh, in many mediums of art, but uh, in painting, but one in, in uh, the, the main one that I've heard him talk most about is encaustic art which is taking pigmented beeswax and, and creating things like this. The texture is amazing. Uh, he does beautiful work. But we stopped on this painting. This is also an encaustic uh, painting by Roger. And, and, and Dale told us the story of how that was in storage for many years. And he said the, the, the primary enemy of encaustic art is freezing. So when these sorts of artworks will freeze, they'll crack. And he said this uh, piece in particular had all these cracks through it and Dale took on the effort of restoring it. And so he talks about taking this piece out and laying it on different hot plates or things to heat up this wax and talking about putting just enough heat on the top uh, in order to get it to bubble just enough so as he stood over it, he could correct it and fill in these cracks. And what's amazing is I stood in front of it yesterday, like you, you can't even see it. He said if too much heat comes, it'll, it'll kind of pop and it'll ruin the whole painting, but, but as I thought about this, I thought about this picture of how the Lord uses the Psalms to shape our emotions. You see, in our culture, we look at emotions in two categories. One, either we avoid them entirely, it's very normal, right? Or we deem them as unchangeable entities in our lives. I'm angry or I'm depressed, and that's just the way I am. You're just going to have to deal with it, and I'm just going to have to deal with it. But, but God actually doesn't see it that way. One of my professors, Jack Collins, he said this. He said, emotions are not problems to be solved, but are a part of the raw material of our now fallen humanity that must be shaped to good and noble ends. C.S. Lewis calls this the chest. Emotions organized by trained habits into stable sentiments. And he says these could be shaped by good or bad things. And he goes on to argue that one of the primary functions of the Psalms is to shape our emotions. And so, friends, as I see us engaging with the Psalms, I see God, sort of like Dale, over the painting that has been broken of our own raw, jacked up sometimes emotions, and just gently putting the right amount of heat to it and reshaping it in a Godward fashion. Reshaping it to match the story of redemption that we find ourselves in. So let me ask you this. What is shaping your emotions? What's shaping your emotions? What are the songs you're listening to? What are the songs you're singing? Is it shaping you into the story of redemption? Or is it shaping you into something far different? Here's a second 
main point today. Podcasts. Podcasts. Oftentimes wisdom, right? And this is the wisdom we become. These podcasts, the wisdom literature, this is the wisdom that we grow into as we study and live them out. Now, three of the main books that fit into the wisdom category uh, are Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. And we get wisdom, right? Uh, many of us are seeking wisdom constantly. We're talking to counsel, wise counselors, friends, grandparents, right? My grandparents, they were very wise, and I would go to them and say, help me. I have a list of nine people, uh, three mentors, three peers, and three people I have led over the course of my life. When I have a major life decision, I'll call them and I'll say, you know me better than anybody. Give me some wisdom, right? Help me know how to navigate life. And so God is saying, I have given you wisdom as well in my word. Now let me give you a little bit of um, an idea of what we're talking about with wisdom literature. Uh, Derek Kidner, a commentator, would say this, these books in particular that I just named are voices in counterpoint used to create contrast with a main element. So let me, let, me, let me go into it a little bit deeper. When you look at the book of Proverbs, it will give you the normal cases of how life usually works out, generalizations. But it also gives us some um, exceptions that are very perplex, right? What Job and Ecclesiastes do is they explore the perplexities, kind of in long form. So the Proverbs are these short, pithy, you know, fire at you statements, they can't go too deeply into it, uh, but what Job and Ecclesiastes does is it digs deeper in the perplexities of when the generalities don't work out, when things don't go quite the way uh, that the wisdom literature would put before us. And so, first question, what is wisdom? What is wisdom as Scripture holds it out to us? Well, in, in a way, we can think of it as a spiritual counterpoint or counterpart to common sense. It's a spiritual counterpart to common sense. Common sense is just saying, yeah, use your head. You know the right thing to do, right? But the difference with spiritual wisdom is that it has a starting point. Spiritual wisdom has a starting point, and it's God. That's what um, uh, Solomon writes in Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. You know, if you want a fresh take on the Proverbs, if you've read it and it's gotten kind of old and stale, I would encourage you to read Eugene Peterson's The Message next to your Bible as you do it. As Eugene Peterson writes here, uh, he says, start with God. In order to gain wisdom, we start with the creator of the universe. Here's, a, here's kind of a loose definition of what wisdom is as we see it in Scripture. It's skill in the art of godly living with a mind and heart in tune with God's values and feelings. And let me just focus on that first phrase, skill in the art of godly living. So we get this, right? If you're a baseball player, uh, you learn the mechanics of fielding a ground ball. And as you do it over and over again, and as there's different situations that happen, as it takes a bad hop off the turf, or uh, if the sun gets in your eyes, or you're running from the side, then, then having practiced it and having studied it, there's some skill and art in there, right? You adjust. You know how to adjust because you've practiced doing it one way for so long, and so you can adjust to that bad hop on the baseball. And this is what essentially wisdom is in Scripture. It's, it's practicing these things so that it becomes a skill that when the art form hits and you have to adjust, you know how to adjust. Let me say this about wisdom as well, is it's prescriptive and not predictive. It's prescriptive and not predictive. We get this because we're all now medical experts since the pandemic. Um, we, uh, it, this prescribes what normally happens, but it's not 100% predictive of what happens because we live in a fallen and broken world. And so, like whatever vaccine may come out, right, it might be prescribed for our well-being, but they don't know how it's going to respond to every blood type, body type, uh, a weakened immune system, a mutation of the disease, right? And so, in a, in a way, that's how we approach wisdom literature. So what are some of the benefits of wisdom literature? And for that, let's look at Proverbs 2. Let's look first at verses 9 and 10. So this is a father talking to his son in this context. He's saying, hey, receive this wisdom. And he says to him, if you do, then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. So here's two things that, that represent benefits of wisdom. The first, it says you'll understand what's righteousness, justice, and equity in every good path. He's basically saying 
you know, you will understand these things that are so important to God to the extent that when you come to a crossroads, a path, you'll just know what the right path is to take. You'll know what to do. That's a benefit of studying God's wisdom. Here's the second one we saw in verse 10. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Basically, your minds will be at peace. When we come to crossroads, they're hard places, aren't they? What he's saying is if you're understanding skill in the art of godly living, you'll know the path to take and there'll be peace as you make these decisions. You can trust this good creator God. Here's the other thing we see in verses 11 and 12. It says, discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech. Friends, God is good in giving us his wisdom because what he offers us here is protection, protecting us from sin and its consequences. The Proverbs does not hide that foolish living and rebellion against God yields consequences in our lives. And that's still true today. God in his goodness is kind of like a parent. I know not everybody in this room are parents, but we get this intuitively as well, don't we? As adults, we intuitively know more than our, our children. And so we say, don't touch that, it's hot, because we know. God, our creator, knows. And he guides us in his good wisdom to protect us because he loves us. This week there was a story of two men standing in line voting for two very different candidates and they got in an argument and the one guy turned around and punched the other one. Guess where the guy who punched him ended up? Jail. Right? That makes sense. There's some wisdom there that's saying, you know, uh, we hear a lot about gentle answers turning away wrath and when anger gets the best of us, we do things that have consequences. Well, let me read this, and this is kind of a death by quote. This is really long, but I think what C.S. Lewis has to say about this is far better than what I could offer you. It's going to be online. You don't have to write it down. Just sit and listen to how C.S. Lewis talks about the use of wisdom. He says this, people often think of Christian morality as a kind of bargain in which God says, if you keep a lot of the rules, I'll reward you, and if you don't, I'll do the other thing. I don't think this is the best way of looking at it. I would much rather say that every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different than what it was before. And taking your life as a whole, with all your innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature. Either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us, at each moment, is progressing to the one state or to the other. Friends, with our podcasts, with what we're listening to, it is either shaping us into our story of redemption or it's shaping us into something far different. Christians, can I exhort us strongly right now to re-up our attention paid to the wisdom literature? Because it has been evident that what is playing in our ears is turning us towards rage and division and loneliness and everything else. And God wants us to listen to his wisdom in that moment to shape us into his story of redemption. So how do we obtain wisdom? How do we obtain it? Anthony, how do I get it? I'm glad you asked. Proverbs 2, 1 to 6, says this. This is the beginning of that same psalm. The father says to his son, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom, and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So how do we obtain wisdom? Well, what he says here is he says, first of all, we're open to it. 
We, we have to start with being willing to receive God's wisdom. If you receive them, if you incline your heart to them, if you open your ears to them. Friends, some of us are just an act of rebellion against God, and we just have, we're just sitting here like this. Mm -mm, nope, nope, don't want to hear what you have to say. The author here is, is begging us to listen to God's wisdom. The other thing that we see is we search for it. So it's not just passive listening, it's, it's searching it out. And the good news is, is he gives it to us right here. So right now, I, I, just, I just want to stop and ask this question. What podcasts are rolling around in our heads? What are we listening to as we walk through our narrative of redemption? Now, here's what we can't ignore. Genesis 3. Every single one of us, as Todd said, are Mephibosheths, right? We will fail in walking this road of wisdom. And that is not to say, what I don't want to do with this next statement is say, uh, stop searching for wisdom with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength because you'll inevitably fail. I think that would just be a false move on my part. But what do we do when, when we fail, when we blow it? Well, the first thing I want us to see about wisdom is, uh, did you hear that last verse there in verse 6? The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. It's very similar to James where it says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask the Lord who gives generously to all without finding fault. You see, wisdom is something that is received. It's not something that we just simply achieve. It's part of a new heart. D.A. Carson says this points us in a different direction. He says, when we feel in our hearts and our minds as we grow older, that there has to be something more, there has to be something more satisfying, there has to be something bigger, we are right to listen to that brooding voice because we were made for God and our souls will be restless until we know him. Those are the kinds of things that wisdom books teach us as the Old Testament barrels along in anticipation of the day when wisdom incarnate, that is, wisdom in the flesh, will come. Friends, this book, Proverbs, these books, Job and Ecclesiastes, they are part of the larger story of Scripture. It's just one section of this book. Tim Keller, in his great little devotional on the proverb says this, wisdom gives up its fullest and richest meaning in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus in Luke 11 calls himself the greater Solomon, the greater wisdom. In fact, in Colossians 2, we see, uh, we see Paul write, uh, encouraging them that their hearts would be changed, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And we've already read it once today, but 1 Corinthians 1.30. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Friends, if we just keep all the pithy proverbs that we find back there, we will uh, probably navigate ourselves relatively well through life. But if we miss Jesus, if we miss Jesus, we remain fools. Because in him is all the wisdom of God. I'm going to talk about that some more as we move towards communion. But let me pray for us as we end the sermon section here. Oh God, would you Make us sing your songs that press us deeper in your story of redemption, that remind us of who you are, that remind us of who we are. And Lord, the wisdom that we are so quick to miss, I pray that we will humble ourselves in seeking you. Lord, not only what you instruct us, Lord, I pray that we will Search your scriptures to enable your wisdom to shape us on how to live our lives. But Father, as we search your Bible, help us to not miss King Jesus, who has become for us our wisdom. Be with us as we move towards communion and pray these things in your name. Amen.
Well, as we come to the table here this morning, and let me just say at the outset, if you were unable to pick up uh, some of the elements on your way in, feel free to walk over and grab them now. But as we see Paul in 1 Corinthians talking to the church, he's basically talking about uh, wisdom of God and, and how that is sometimes viewed as foolishness. Let me just read to you a couple of verses. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 18, the word of the cross is folly, foolishness, the opposite of wisdom to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then if you look at 25, it says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What's happening here? Paul's saying the cross is actually foolishness to those who don't know Jesus. But he's saying it is the wisdom of God to those of us who know him. Why? Well, the cross doesn't make sense in the human economy. The human economy is one of of self-sustaining, and I'm in charge, and, and I'm in power. Even in this context, you have the Jewish people who are saying, Jesus, you're not really the Messiah uh, because, you know, you're not coming in power with miracles to overthrow the government. And to the Greeks, they're saying, you are not a Messiah, and you are not coming in power because you can't sit down with the philosophers. Like, you're going to win by intellectual argument. And Paul's saying, you know what? Both of those are just power plays. That's wise to you. But you know what the cross does? It admits we're weak. It admits we are Mephibosheth and we have nothing to bring to the table. And if we lay hold of that, that actually becomes power to the believer. Not to lord over someone else, but to be confident in Jesus becoming our wisdom when we fail miserably. As we come to the table today, this table is for anyone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ, who have said, I am Mephibosheth. <laughs> Apart from you, I can do nothing spiritually. I bring no spiritual resume to the table. I receive you as being my wisdom and my wisdom alone. If you have not, or if you have made this profession of faith in this or another Bible-believing church, then this meal is for you. And if you have not, I would invite you to consider the foolishness of the cross and how that could be your wisdom. If there are some of you who especially after this week examine your own hearts and say, yeah, uh, you know, I'm okay with dealing with my own wisdom. I don't want to to engage God and how he has called me to live and follow this king. If you have sin that you are unwilling to confess to him or to another brother or sister in Christ, well then I would say uh, for right now God's word would warn us in 1 Corinthians to, to not take of this meal but to repent quickly to God and to one another. But friends, this is not a meal for the perfect, and so uh, let me give you an opportunity to just confess your sin to him silently at your seat. And if you do, uh, God says, hey, uh, you are invited as an imperfect person to come and be reminded of my perfection on your behalf and, and, and sit in his wisdom and power this morning. So let me give you a minute to confess at your seats, and I'll close this in a moment. Father, I, I praise you that like David, even when we are in our most shameful moments, that you tell us if, if you confess your sin and your brokenness to me, I will cover it. I have covered it with my blood and you can approach the throne and the table with confidence. Jesus, encourage us with this meal this morning. Would you set these elements apart for your glory and our good? And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, friends, I want us to take a moment and just sit and reflect on the table and what it means as we listen to this song, and then I'll continue in just a minute. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My 
my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair, tells me of the guilt within upward i look and see him there made an end to all my sin because the sinless savior died my sinful soul is counted free for god the just is satisfied Sing with us. seated. As we move to taking these elements, just a couple of tips to help you navigate this in a strange time. First of all, with your mask, just pull it down over your chin when you go to eat. You don't have to do it quite yet, but when you go to eat, because it takes a while to figure out how you do this. Uh, the second part is, is feel free to start uh, without taking the elements, working that little purple tab back off the top to grab the bread. Uh, and so let me, let me just read these words of institution for us. We're going to take this together. But Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you take of it, do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. Friends, go ahead and grab the bread. Take it in your hands. The wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. For you. Broken for you. Take and eat. Go ahead and pull the second tab back. folly of the cross, the foolishness of God, greater than the wisest in humankind, his blood shed for you. 
take and drink. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this meal. We pray that as we leave here, as we are struck with messages of what true wisdom, what true power, what true glory is, I pray that you will remind us and nourish us with the reality that this meal and the folly of the cross is all the power we need to follow you for all eternity. Thank you for this time. Would you shape us into that story of redemption as we leave? We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, if you would, please stand and close with me in the singing of the doxology this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Receive these words of blessing. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace if you would. Just remember, let the ushers come and dismiss you. Make your way up the ramp and feel free to hang out and spend some time in this beautiful weather having fellowship with one another. Thanks for joining us.